Mr. Wayne. So uh, I will dispense with the long-winded uh, introduction for brevity's sake um, and let you know that we'll have two speakers for this session. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to Alan Murray of Aparian, who uh, will um, offer some introduction and context. Uh, and uh, I think this should be uh, an exciting and interesting session, a little bit different from what we um, normally do. Uh, and i um, excited to have Luigi from the Celtics here. So Alan, without further ado, I give it over to you. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Everybody doing well? Spring in Boston? Yeah? Do we believe it? I don't know. It's cold this morning. So. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Product for a company called Aperion. We're a local Boston-based company. Uh, we do mobile management. What that really means is we help enterprises protect and secure um, data, sensitive data, and sensitive applications on mobile devices that are often owned by their employees. And at the same time, we help protect the employee from the prying hands of the, you know, nasty guys in IT that are trying to get at your pictures and your data and stuff like that. So we help companies walk the thin line between how do you manage private sensitive corporate data and how do you manage private sensitive personal data on the same device. And usually I'm talking to technologists, right? So how many folks today in the room are, you know, full on marketing folks work in some function in marketing? Okay. Any, any technologists in the room today? Cool. All right. So the technology guys, you can like keep me honest through this, and the marketing guys, you can sort of believe me, right? Most of the time. The what I wanted to give you was a little peek behind the scenes of what your customers are thinking about in relation to mobile inside of the enterprise. So everyone's concerned about it, right? There's all kinds of exciting, positive, great things we can do with mobile, and mobile's absolutely transforming the way we do business and things like that. But there's a lot of IT guys that are struggling with a lot of challenges in the background behind that. And the enterprise has got some real issues to sort of contend with. So I thought we'd talk to you a little bit about that so you'd understand what's going on behind the scenes and keep that in mind. And it'll help you engage your customers and understand that world a little bit better. And then Luigi will come up and we'll introduce him and he'll give you some nice real world case study of what this means for the Boston Celtics organization. Okay. So um, let's talk about DVD players. So who remembers DVD players? Who still has a DVD player? Who's used a DVD player in the last month? Really? Okay, cool. That's, uh, that's about right. For those of you that were facing the front, there was like three or four people in here have actually used one in the last month. Now, there's something really interesting about DVD players. Um, DVD players rocked the consumer electronics world, absolutely rocked it. They shattered all records of adoption. And we sold more DVD players in the first year than any other technology prior to that. Okay, and in the first year, it was 350,000 DVD players. This was unheard of in consumer electronics. This was faster adopted than, oh, I don't know, things like the telephone, things like the automobile, things like so on. So if you kind of look at how quickly we adopted them, after seven years, 50% of, this is U.S. data, 50% of U.S. households had a DVD player in them. Right now they're almost like digital clocks, right? You just look at DVD player and everything. You know, my car has got two. Why do I need two in my car, right? But, but they're everywhere. But this was so interesting in the sense that you think of technologies that are ubiquitous, like the VHS recorder, for instance. It didn't come close to that level of penetration. Digital camera, it's not even close to that penetration after seven years. Television, nowhere near as deeply adopted as the DVD player. And one of the things that's interesting about this is it indicates a rate of change or an accelerated rate of change in consumer technologies. So this DVD thing, this record stood for a long time until uh, we shipped a little thing called the, the iPhone. And the iPhone absolutely shattered that record. Right? The iPhone's not even seven years old. Like we haven't even hit that seven year mark yet. Does anybody remember? Any, how old's the iPhone? Take a guess. Yeah, so we got about a quarter to go to hit that seven-year mark. So it, it shipped at the end of June, early July in 2007. So we're almost there. But we've absolutely shattered that record. So to put it into a little bit of perspective, that was the number of DVD players that shipped in the first year. This is the number of iPhones that shipped in the first 90 days. It's amazing, right? And that record stuck. Right? It's not, <laughs> for a little while, it's not the king anymore because then the iPad came along. And in the first 40 or 90 days of the iPad shipping, we more than tripled the number of units that were sold. It's kind of astounding, right? 
So another way to look at it, to give you a little bit of perspective, if this represents the number of iPads that shipped in the first 48 hours, first 48, this is the number of iPhone 5s that shipped in the first 48 hours. And in case you think that's slowing down, this is the number of iPhone 5s's and 5c's that shipped in the first 48 hours. It's kind of tremendous, right? See the trend? Yeah. So one of the things that's kind of interesting about that is I don't know what's coming next. I have no idea. I wish I did. If I knew it was coming next, I wouldn't be speaking to you guys. I'd be out, you know, playing the market somewhere, right? But I do know this, whatever piece of technology comes next is going to be adopted even faster than that. Now think about this from sort of the enterprise perspective for a little bit. Uh, in the enterprise perspective, a lot of these devices are what we call BYOD, or bring your own device. That means that employees are bringing them into work and starting to use their own technology, self-provisioned technology, if you will, um, to do enterprise work with it. And this creates a bit of a dilemma for a lot of enterprises because Sensitive information, sensitive data is sitting on devices that they can't completely control. And I don't have more recent data, but 2012, US alone, eight and a half million iOS and Android devices were activated on cellular networks on Christmas Day. Eight and a half million. So come January 2nd, January 3rd, how many of those do you think went back to work? A lot of them, right? And how many of them sat under the Christmas tree with a little tag on them that said, hey, great job, Merry Christmas, love your boss. Right. Probably not most, right? So these were legitimate Christmas presents. People bought them for themselves. Families bought them for them. And now all of a sudden, they're becoming corporate assets. So it's an interesting challenge. Um, I've been picking on the iPhone. And the iPhone is sort of an easy market for us to understand because it's one thing. iPhones, iPads, OK, it's two things. You caught me. But we kind of understand what they are. They're, they're, they're pretty much the same, right? We know what an iPad is. All iPads kind of look alike. We know what an iPhone is. All iPhones kind of look alike. The Android world, the other smartphone competitor, is a little more interesting and poses some kind of unique challenges on its own. Um, has anybody ever heard the phrase fragmentation in reference to the Android market? We talk about Android fragmentation a lot. So what that really means is there's a whole lot of them. Right? They're all very, very, very different. And that poses some interesting and unique challenges, too. So let's take a look at this. Uh, this is uh, a tree map created by a company called OpenSignal. Um, OpenSignal, they create a set of programming APIs that you can use to embed maps in your applications. So if you've got a map inside of your app, chances are you're using Google and you're using OpenSignal's APIs. So they have a very, very unique perspective on because every app's got a map in it these days, right? They have a very, very unique perspective on the types of devices that are hitting their APIs, and it's incredibly well adopted. So what this shows is that fragmentation in the Android market. Each one of these blocks is a unique type of Android device, as identified by the form factor, version of the operating system it's running, the capabilities of the device, the chipset, the carrier, and so on. So it's an absolute unique hit. In one year, they got 682,000 devices surveyed. So it's a pretty good sample size, right? Almost 12,000 distinct types of Android device. That's incredible. So that's a combination of operating system, form factor, chipset, manufacturer, and things like that. 12,000, 300% increase year over year. These kind of numbers are astounding. If you're sitting inside of an IT organization trying to say, I need to support an Android device, it's an absolute tsunami, right, that's coming towards you. So you think, all right, that's easy. We got a good handle on it. We'll just put some management software out there and we'll get a little handle on that infrastructure and we'll be good to go. Well, current data from the market tells us that about 68 million smartphones have been sold. Okay, so that's quite a few. And if you do a little bit of math and you look and say, how many of those are sitting inside of enterprises? So I did a little bit of math and went out and hit the uh, U.S. Department of Labor statistics found out that there's 18,500 companies in the U.S. that have 500 employees or more. So that gives us a good sample of what an enterprise might look like. We know from companies like Gartner and IDC and that sort of thing that about 6,600 of those actually have device management in some form or another. So those 68 million U.S. smartphones, you're with me so far in the math, 
about 25 million, give or take, some 24 and change million um, devices are actually in the enterprise. Right? So we're sticking around in those 18,500 companies and are owned by people between, say, workforce age of 21 to 65 years old. So that means 25 million of those 68 million are actually managed, but the reality is not every one of those companies manages every single device. They simply can't. Why? Because you saw that tidal wave of how quickly they're coming in. We can't get ahead of it. We can't manage them as fast as they're being deployed. We can't manage them as fast as they're coming in. So it's really about 6 million likely, which is about a 7% solution. And that's just looking at phones. That's not looking at, excuse me, tablets as a form factor at all. So it's kind of scary, right? Right? And that's what IT is sort of facing on a daily basis. Um, sometimes I'll hold up a mobile phone and I say, what do you see? Right? Do you see everything that Gene Roddenberry promised you from Star Trek? You know, it's a communicator, it's a computer, it's, a, you know, all the, it's my tricorder, it's all of my sensors and my answers to everything. Or is it a 128 gigabyte data theft device? And the answer is it's both of those things to the enterprise. And it's a matter of where on that continuum they want to see and they have to continually look at it both ways all the time. Uh, that's just the software, or sorry, just the hardware. What about the software side? So um, mobile apps are kind of becoming exciting, and we're seeing more and more companies build what we call apps that matter. And these are apps that fundamentally transform the way the business occurs, right? They change something unique about the business process. They give the company competitive advantage. They give them a different view on data or a different view on capability than any of their competitors have. So they're important. They're also expensive. Uh, and I thought what might be kind of fun is if we went through and kind of built an app together today. Well, we're not actually going to build it, but we're going we're to price it out. Um, let's have a look. So there we go. Let's wait for the screens. So let's build an app. Um, let me give you a scenario. Let's say we are an insurance company and we want to build an application for our insurance agents, right, individuals who go out and investigate fender benders. Right? So we've got a report that there's been a car accident, we pulled it from the police, we want to go out and get some photographs on the scene and things like that. So let's build an app for that because we think if we can be responsive and we can gather evidence directly on the screen right, or directly on the scene, we're going to be a heck of a lot more responsive to our customers. Right? We're going to be the best insurance company to deal with. We're going to have good accurate visualization of what happened at the scene so we're not going to overpay or underpay. It's going to be impactful to our business. So what do you think we should build? You guys help me drive this. Should we support, I'm going to say we should support iPad for sure. You want to support Androids? Okay, we saw how many of them are out there. Um, you want to support phones too or just tablets? It's your app, so you guys, phones, okay. Uh, heard a lot about this Windows stuff that's coming out. Windows, I think we could probably support Windows. Okay, so we'll support Windows too. Um, never mind the web. We may not have connectivity all the time. So we'll just support those things. Okay, that sounds good. So now let's build some features. Um, well, we got to have a way for the individual agents to sort of log in and identify themselves. So email is a pretty good way to do that. So let's say we're going to have email login support. Do you think we need Facebook? Probably, probably not. Hey, look at the car accident I was at today. Eh, yeah, probably not. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, dashboards. Everybody loves dashboards, right? So we need a dashboard. Activity feed. Sounds good. You got to know somehow, like, I need you to go to this car accident next, right? There's got to be a way to sort of bring that down. That's good. Rating system. Best car accident ever. No, nah, probably not. Maybe, maybe pass on that. Camera. Yeah, it'd be pretty useful. Uh, geolocation. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. Compass. Anybody other than a Boy Scout ever use a compass for anything, right? And they only do it because they have to to get a badge, so we'll probably skip on that. Uh, custom user interface. Sure, we probably want it to look a little interesting. Accept payments. Eh, I think there's a word for that. It's called bribery. <laughs> it's just like the insurance agent shows up and like hands you a credit. You hand him a credit card. And it's like it's all it's, it's all taken care of. Um, sync access to devices, eh, give or take. Uh, how about the camera? That's probably pretty useful, right? So we'll do that. Should they be able to play music? Maybe we'll pass on that. Messaging, give or take. Sounds like a nice to have, but not a necessary, right? We can pass on that. Maps, probably very useful to go with the geolocation. A shopping cart, eh, 
and we're probably not going to sell them insurance at that particular point, so, so we can sort of pass on that. A task list, that sounds useful because we're going to schedule people. Uh, a search capability, I'm going to suggest yes. Gallery of photos, probably. QR codes, I doubt it. Uh, calendar integration, probably makes a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, social sharing, maybe not so much. Third-party integration, absolutely. There's going to be all kinds of insurance and rating systems and stuff like that in the back end that we have to talk to. Uh, definitely, we care about privacy. And I don't know if we want to text or not, but let's leave it off. So let's take a look at that. That's a $329,000 app. And we haven't even started coding. Right? And how accurate do I think that quote is? I don't know. We probably lowballed it by about half. So most applications these days especially ones that matter, have a pretty big price tag associated with them. It's not unusual at all to see apps with north of a million dollars as a price tag to develop. Are we rethinking now that Windows support thing, by the way? And it's like, okay, if we, if we kind of drop that off, or we're, we're down to a quarter of a million, that sounds like a pretty decent budget. Maybe we can build something like that. Um, South by Southwest. Anybody here go to South by this year? Yeah, a few. So South by is an interesting case study in this. Um, South by have an application that they use as a scheduler, and it tells you everything that's going on in the conference, the entire length of the conference. I'm guessing, just based on the quality and the apps I've seen and the amount of effort I know that's in it, it's probably close to a million dollar application, very close. It's at least 500,000, so it's somewhere between half a million and a million. The whole of Southwest, South by Southwest lasts 10 days. So you've got a million dollar asset that has a 10 day life cycle. So let's extend it a little bit and say, yeah, we had to test it and that sort of thing. So, you know, maybe it's 60 to 90 days and that's it. So that's a tremendous amount of money to try and put on that tsunami of phones that are coming and those devices that are coming that you have to get it to run on all of them. You have to get it to support as much as all of them. You have to keep all of those individuals uh, data secure and private at the same time on that massively shifting field. So exciting promise, terrifying absolutely terrifying challenges. Right? So try to explain to somebody that you're going to get an ROI in 10 days on a million dollar investment and you don't get to control the, all of the technology that it's being deployed on. It's pretty daunting. Next year, they'll dust it all off and start from scratch. So does that make sense? Is it? Right? Is the least? It's interesting stuff to me. I hope it's interesting stuff to you guys. Just waiting for PowerPoint to come back. I can show you another pretty picture. We've got our monitors mixed up, so you can see what I can see. So I wanted to give you guys a little indication of apps that matter. Um, let you know what some of our customers are doing with those. And I don't know, guys, if you can fix that external monitor problem for me or if I need to do it myself. Maybe if I just exit the show and come back in. So how about that local sports team? You know, like the Celtics. Cool. I think we're good. So one of our customers is Cisco. And I don't know why you guys aren't going to get to see that. All right. I'll just tell them about it. I'll tell you about them. So uh, one of our customers is Cisco. And Cisco have built um, one app that I would call classify very much as an app that matters. Um, Cisco, as you can imagine, they sell very complicated technology to very complicated customers. It's never a matter of, I'd like six of those at this price. Oh, great, here's your bill, and away we go. The sales cycle for Cisco products is incredibly long. It's incredibly complicated, and it has all kinds of approvals. Approvals for discounts, approvals for configurations, and so on. So Cisco thought they could take advantage of all of the mobile phones and the iPads that people were carrying, and they could speed up their sales cycle. They could increase their velocity of sales if they took all of that approval process and they put it in the palm of somebody's hand. So they built an application to do that. And that application now took days out of their sales cycle. So they were getting real-time approvals at the end of a quarter, you know, like instantly, rather than, ah, oh, that sat in somebody's inbox over the weekend and we didn't get it through and so we pushed that deal to the next quarter or the next sales cycle or something like that. So it's had a tremendous, absolutely tremendous impact on their business to be able to do that. One of the challenges, of course, that they had is how do I do that to a group of people where I don't control the device and I don't control 
their life. I can't just sort of push it out to them. So adoption of that application became a critical challenge for those guys. And that was something that we were able to help them, help them solve. Another interesting example of a company that's doing apps that matter is uh, Estee Lauder. Um, folks are familiar with the Estee Lauder, right? Familiar with the Clinique brand, I assume, most people. It's one of the most recognized you know, brands in the world. So Estee decided that they wanted to start attracting a younger demographic. And they wanted to um, interact with that demographic in a way that was, I guess, that those people wanted to be interacted with, which meant let's find a way to do mobile. So what they created was an application. Uh, we actually helped them write this application. It's an application that you go up. It's a point of sale. You identify yourself. You ask a few questions. You ask a few questions by the iPad. Do you get a lot of sleep at night? Do you have any problem areas? How old are you? What's your ethnicity? Things like that. And it spits out a product recommendation at the end. And you take that product recommendation to the counter and say, I'd like to purchase these things. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Had a remarkable impact on their business. So they found that on average, a person buys three times as much from an iPad as they do a flesh and blood sales book. Why do you think that is? Well, number one answer given, I don't think the iPad lies to me. But I think the sales clerk does. When you sort of double click on that and push a little harder and say, why don't you think the iPad lies to you? It's because they didn't lie to the iPad. And that's the real truth. You didn't care. So when the iPad says, how old are you? You don't go, I'm 27. When the iPad says, do you get a lot of sleep and take good care of yourself? You don't go, oh, yeah, yeah I'm 40. I got no problem. So people were actually truthful to the iPad. And so they believed the recommendations that came back. So the places that they've deployed these, which is now over 12,000 locations worldwide. It's in 37 languages. And it's in interesting spots, right? It's not like they own um, the infrastructure where these things are deployed. They're in duty-free shops in airports. They're in Macy's department stores. They're in territory and you know that's foreign and the public gets to interact with. And it's created an incredible challenge for them to sort of deploy something that's had such an impact on their business. Three times as much. The counters where they've deployed them, they're doing about a 40% increase about a 40% increase in revenue. So it's become a tremendous part um, of a go forward. They won a few industry awards as well for changing the face of retail. So there are apps that matter, but the world is incredibly hostile that we have to deploy them in. And I'm going to give you a third sort of case study on how that's worked. And that's actually um, Luigi Subara from, from the Celtics is going to tell you a little bit now about what challenges the Celtics are facing and how they go. So folks, Luigi. So I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I get to work for the Boston Celtics. And when people ask me what I do, and I'm using this joke because this is the audience for it, I tell everybody I'm a rim protector because I'm the only person in the company that still has a BlackBerry. And I'm going to blame that on being Canadian. But that wasn't bad. See, that I, work that never would have gone over. Um, so I'm a basketball statistician and app developer for the Celtics. I uh, started in 2012. and. I came from quite a few dev shops before that. And one of the things that I didn't understand about uh, an NBA team is what do they actually do outside of you know, the guys they throw on the court and the entertainment value in, in the arena. So I kind of made it my goal, uh, my first you know, six months there, to kind of see what it is we do in terms of uh, you know, ticket sales, et cetera. So I was able to kind of categorize it into kind of four groups generalizing a little bit. Um, obviously, ticket sales, corporate partnership, uh, social media, and where I work in basketball operations. And I was really interested to see the data that flows through all those departments and how they use it to make decisions. Um, our social media department is kind of a standard social media department in terms of we have a public-facing website run by the NBA, Celtics.com. Good plug there if uh, you want to see the information about the draft. Um, you know, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have Instagram, and you know, we use all that inside the arena and uh, obviously when the games aren't going on. Um, our ticket operations is very sophisticated in the sense that we do dynamic pricing based on um, you know, who's coming to the arena, what day of the week it is, et cetera. But they are very archaic in the sense that we don't really move data well. We kind of have older ticketing systems, and we're still doing things in Excel for the most part. And you know, it's very difficult to roll up that information to uh, the higher ups. 
And then we get to our basketball operations department, and you would think that would be behind, and that's actually ahead. We have uh, an assistant GM who's one of the pioneers of advanced analytics, and he made a real push to bring in a lot of data into the basketball operations organization and start using it to evaluate uh, the talent that we have. So at first when I got there, I, I looked at the data and I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna be working with big data and this is gonna be really exciting and as a database guy, that was you know, something I was really looking forward to. And then I realized it wasn't big data at all. We were just getting data from the NBA, from nightly games. Um, so it was a very small amount of data and we had a SQL server in the back end and we had everything rolled up in a you know, ASP.NET website. And one of the kind of major complaints is that you know, our coaches and our scouts and a lot of our basketball operations people are on the road. They're on, a, on the road a fair majority of the time. And not only are they on the road, but they're sitting on an airplane where they probably don't have any connectivity or they're sitting in a kind of dungy arena somewhere where you know, they're in Puerto Rico watching the under 17 Americas tournament. You know, so they don't, they don't have Wi-Fi there in order to take notes, et cetera. So the challenge was how do we get this information uh, to these people and how do we allow them to send information back to us? And then on top of that, all of a sudden, the data did start to get bigger. So I don't know how many people know of the sports view technology at all. So uh, Stats Inc, a company out of Chicago, has uh, worked on uh, what they call sports view cameras. And there's six cameras that sit in now all 29 NBA arenas. And it actually records the X, Y, Z, that's my Canadian coming through, X, Y, Z uh, position of each of the players and the ball. And so we're tracking all that motion and then storing that data and having the ability to model it statistically to look at you know, very high level things like how many touches per game, dribbles, et cetera. And then we're gonna use it for more sophisticated stuff. So all of a sudden now that data is getting huge. It's um, 25 frames per second. And if you think of you know, 48 minutes per game and then all the games that happen across the NBA, we now have bigger data. Uh, throw on top of that um, a lot of college data that we're now receiving. I'm sure everybody knows that we didn't have the greatest of seasons this year. However, you know, we're putting a lot of uh, work into drafting well and looking at the college players and see what value they have. And also we do a lot of international work. So we have people, we have people actually right now in Germany and in uh, Croatia, I believe, um, scouting players and trying to send reports back to us um, to look for guys in the, in the future. So now we've got two challenges. We've got bigger and bigger data and we've got to be able to deliver that data to um, our staff. So we started off small. Um, we started off building a very small app, uh, play logging app, and, and I was on the, on the iPad. And what it did was uh, it actually logged all the plays that we ran throughout a game. So we had somebody, one of our assistant coaches with an iPad, and they would sit there and they would um, tag everything in terms of what defense we're running and what offensive plays. And then at the end of every game, we'd get that information uploaded uh, through the app to our database and then use that to see you know, what were we successful at. And it was more so not for short term, you know, we weren't worried about in game so much as you know, throughout the season. So as we play, you know, did play 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 times, what worked with what personnel. Um, and so we needed a way to be able to distribute that app to the people that, that mattered. Um, and so when I got there, our VP of technology had already worked with the Perian to use the uh, Perian catalog to distribute that app across the, uh, the devices that our coaches uh, were using. And it was uh, very successful and something I picked up rather quickly because it's uh, very easy to use. And it just, it worked very well. And so we were excited to then go on and start to build more apps. So the next thing we wanted to do was um, trade checker. So we wanted to see, well, let me, let me back up. We have very curious minds in our front office. So quite often um, people would come up with trades and we had really no way to verify whether those trades would work. I shouldn't say no way, we had one way. Our assistant GM, Mike Zarin, had built a spreadsheet to check trades and he's had this for years now, but he was the only one with access to it. Um, we went uh, to appear in and asked if they could develop a trade checker app for us. And this was you know, something a little out of our scope because it had sensitive data 
this really had to work uh, offline. Um, you know, and so we had things that we just couldn't an handle in house. So we worked with them to, to, to build this trade checker and you know, it's something that's gonna be used by our front office, especially in this kind of important time now uh, when the lottery balls fall where they may uh, and, and the draft. Um, so, so we're very lucky to, to kind of have that resource and to be able to, to use it. And so now the next big challenge for us is how do we start serving all this, this big data? Um, you know, our next step in our front office is to be able to translate all this information we have about all the players across all the spaces uh, into something that can run, uh, you know, basically on, on an iPad or on an iPhone anywhere across the world. And so, you know, that's, it's a very interesting problem for us because for, for me, you know, I grew up, I'm not that old to be able to say that, but, you know, I grew up in a very traditional kind of Windows development environment. So kind of the mobile platform for me is, is you know, something that I'm starting to branch out to. And I've always struggled to, and, you know, and we're struggling right now to figure out how do we serve all this data in a very concise manner? You know, how do we have the dashboard that we're paying, you know, or according to the app, paying $40,000 for to be able to show what we want to, uh, you know, to the assistant GM or the GM of the, of the Boston Celtics. Um, so it's, you know, we're very happy to be in this space, but we still have a lot of learning to do to kind of see how to use this uh, effectively. And, you know, we're very unique too in the sense that, especially with the basketball operations, uh, applications, we don't have um, hundreds of users. You know, we have basically 10 users. 10 users with very sensitive data. So, you know, we want to make sure that that's managed uh, very, uh, you know, very closely. Uh, we want to make sure that updates get out there, especially, you know, when we talk about trade checkers. Contracts update, you know, potentially daily, depending on the time of time of year it is, so we want to be able to push that information out in a timely manner so we're making proper decisions uh, on proper data. So, you know, I'm, you know, very excited to, to, to see what kind of lies ahead in the next six months to a year in terms of what we're going to develop uh, on, on our platforms. Um, yeah, thank you, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Boom. So the takeaway from you guys is, as just a, a final to wrap up, is you know, I want you to think about three things. Number one, companies are really starting to make applications that have a huge impact on how they define the business, the way they define the business, and how they go about doing business. The second thing is that's just different from the electronic storefront. Right? So usually when we think about companies and mobile, we think, what's that shopping cart app look like? But it's not just about that anymore. And third, and finally, they're trying to get these things deployed on the most unfriendly battlefield IT has ever faced in the history of technology inside of the enterprise. So keep that in mind. Those are the impacts that mobile is having today for most enterprises and most of the challenges they're facing. And I think we've got a few minutes left for questions if we want, and then time's back to you. So I'm not sure I followed the question. What? Oh, in, in, in the cost of that application? Almost all of it. Almost all of it is time. Time in coding, right? time in design, time in user acceptance, time in testing. Time in, it's very, very little materials. Almost 100% almost labor cost. You can go first. Yeah, so that's that's kind of an interesting problem in general with analytics and sports is that you know you've got a bunch of nerds for you know sake of argument who are developing these statistical models who say you know well my regression says that you should be shooting from this location on the floor with a standard error of this. <clears throat> well, if I go give that to a coach, they're gonna look at me like I have four heads. If I give that to a player, it'd be even worse. 
So the biggest challenge is to be able to take that and change it into, you know, if you want to use user interface, but some sort of report that makes sense to them, whether that's a modified shot chart, whether that's just saying, you know, hey, listen, tell player X to shoot from this location on, on these sets of plays. But that's, that's a big challenge in general, and you see it in a lot of sports. Uh, and so that's why some sports can't even get over the hurdle, uh, you know, in analytics like hockey, for instance, um, because you still have a front office that has a kind of an old school mentality that doesn't want to put the effort into being able to relay that information to their coaches and players. For us, it's, it's user experience and security are equally weighed, and you have to balance both simultaneously. We almost always start with some level of user acceptance testing, though, and, and UX. Um, there's sort of a dirty little secret in the industry today, and that's the adoption of mobile apps is dreadful. And a lot of the reason for that is people build what we call crap applications. You know, it's just like nobody, it's like, I don't want to use that. I've got my beautiful $600 phone, and you want me to use that on it? So we know part of the business success and the ROI on the project really has a lot to do with user experience in the case. So we start there. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting, right? Is um, we're used to doing IT projects right, historically that are really, really big. We say, hey, we got a couple of million dollars for this project. We got a year and a half to do it. We're going to lock ourselves away for six months, gather requirements, build something without talking to anybody. <laughs> it's not going to fit the needs. We're going to pilot it on people we hate when we've made their lives miserable enough for a while. We're going to deploy it and declare success. And about 85% of large IT projects fail. And, and those are the reasons they fail, of course. Um, and the care and feeding is something that comes afterwards. With mobile, you don't see that's changed so quickly, right? The life cycle is so short. Um, sometimes instead of seeing an app revved every three years, we're seeing an app rev three times a day, right? And you're doing it directly with the user and you're almost building in real time. So everything is accelerated tremendously. And yeah, the cost to build versus the cost to maintain, it's probably, you know, a third of that again. But remember most apps, not as short as a South by Southwest, but most apps these days have a very, very short life cycle. Traditionally, IT was years. Now it's months. Questions for Alan and me? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.